I hope you enjoyed lunch and networking. Um, this afternoon, we're going to address the other aspects of trauma. How do we deal with it? And how do we psychologists? I'd like to introduce Dr. Bridget McCarthy. We met in 2017 at a seminar in Queen's University run by the great Professor Jay Kenny, who's a noted authority on whistleblowing and was one of my sponsors to do my PhD. And we were both doing a PhD at the time. At least. I'd started, or I was about yeah. to start, I'd just done a master's, mm -hmm. and you were about a year in front of me. Um, so to Dr. Stanton now, um, Bridget did her thesis on a study of whistleblowing and bystanding, the systemic issues which shape workers' reactions to wrongdoing within organisations across a range of sectors, and is also a qualified psychologist. So you couldn't hope for a better qualified person other than Cecile, who's going to talk to you in a moment, <laughs> who is also a clinical psychologist and an academic and a PhD in the same field. So I'm not going to waste her time any further. Bridget, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so, um, yes, that's it. I'm going to try and make it work myself. So I conducted a study of how individuals decided to speak up or remain silent in the face of wrongdoing in their employing organisation, as Ian's already told you. So observing trauma amongst whistleblowers wasn't therefore the main focus of my research, but I will summarise my research for you as briefly as I can, I'm still making any kind of sense at all. But along the way, I did hear about much distress entailed by my participants in their journey towards the decision about how to take action. Um, but I think <laughs> that I hope that I will keep coming back to and emphasizing through this talk is to think about bystanders and they haven't had much of a look in so far today. So um, Vatla Pavel's famous remark. Um, I think that that was, uh, for me, a very inspiring um, uh, thought, rem a remark. Um, and my awareness that was sensitised by talking to my participants was reinforced by what I've learned subsequently from working with distressed NHS staff working on the front line during COVID in beleaguered midwifery services, which must have spawned more whistleblowing cases than most, and working with people in senior positions in mental health services. But I guess that my interest and concern was initially triggered by me remaining silent, and I think that, that explains my interest in bystanders, while witnessing an egregious act of bullying of a, um, of a valued colleague by a more senior uh, figure. And then, to my amazement, finding myself in tears 10 years later when I was interviewed by a panel who were investigating the bully's professional practice. And so it left me pondering the answers to these questions. Why attempt to speak truth to power when you could choose to do that instead? <laughs> so the structure of what I'm going to talk about is Ian's already told you uh, the title of my research. Um, I shall summarise my research, which aimed to understand, as we've already said, the journey from living within the lie to living the truth. And next, I will attempt very briefly to review evidence for the impact on an individual of speaking out and remaining silent, and then suggest a range of recovery strategies. And a lot of that's been spoken to very powerfully during the morning, so I'm really um, talking about the research, I guess. Um, so, what was my purpose in doing that research? Well, personal and theoretical curiosity, which I think I was already, I've already talked to, I was motivated by the curiosity about the process of thinking and acting outside prevailing norms. And whistleblowing struck me as an appropriate um, thing to look at in order to try and understand that. Um, 
And in addition, my own experience of feeling silenced by internal and external pressures in the face of poor practice during a long working life in frontline mental health services. Um, so my main research questions were broadly, I wanted to know what systemic individual and cultural factors are associated with the choice to speak out or remain silent, and perhaps more importantly, how those three factors interacted. Um, so I use the classic conventional definition that's used in research and policy setting, but with the addition of retaliation um, to avoid the definition simply panning out as efficient accountability. So the first, the first six, five factors would amount to efficient accountability until you get to the retaliation. And the retaliation is a very important part of what I found myself thinking about and looking at. So the cosy heroic narrative about whistleblowers as, um, as, as heroes hides a pyrrhic victory, as we've already heard so powerfully this morning. And these are the sorts of things that they can be called heroes, secular saints, um, right? sorry, <laughs> and finally, scapegoats. All of these things, these are labels liberally applied to whistleblowers. What I turned to was, appropriate enough for where we are, um, Foucault's ideas. Quantitative surveys had produced a mass of equivocal findings, as far as I could tell from my reading the literature. Um, lots of different comp and competing um, ideas about whistleblower characteristics, the characteristics of institutions and so on. So I felt that I needed a better understanding which would take account of the systemic and relational nature of the act. And that was what my focus was. Someone who speaks and someone is required to listen and together they constitute an act of whistleblowing. It isn't about the individual alone. And Foucault's account of the Parisians speaking truth to power therefore came in very handy for me. And it shifted the focus from the motivations and experiences of an isolated, autonomous individual whistleblower towards a focus on process and a focus on an individual as a constructed being in action. So um, this was, uh, um, as, as I approached my data collection, this was the nature of whistleblowing that I was thinking about. I'd realised that it was complex. It involves ethics, policy, legal and financial considerations. They're all there in the mix. That it was processual and that that was central to my thinking, that it was about an unfolding sequence of events and that it's nuanced. It's a series of dimensions, not binary categories. There isn't something called loyalty and something called dissent in separate boxes. They're continuums. Likewise, staying silent and finding a voice. They're not separate, distinct categories. Um, and finally, that it's a wicked problem. It's about values, not facts. So um, these were the theoretical influences in my study. Um, I was very much working within a sy systemic and psychodynamic framework. And on the right are some of the key um, thinkers and writers in that field. And the other uh, theoretical approach I had was that to look at the socially constructed individual and their context. Um, and that was very much missing from most of the research that I'd read, apart from the esteemed Professor Kenny, who's already um, had a shout out. So um, this is what I did. I um, collected narratives of whistleblowers and bystanders, and a subsidiary study was an analysis of cultural representations of whistleblowers, whistleblowing in film. Um, that was my interview procedure, and I'm not going to take up time explaining that to you, but essentially it, it elicited a narrative about the lived life, and life was told from each of my informants. My informants were, um, were drawn from a range of organisational contexts because I wanted to make comparisons and draw abstractions 
I was able to re recruit a couple of bystanders, they're the plus ones, um, by the generosity of a couple of my whistleblowing participants, one of whom is sitting here. So what, what I had was a set of whistleblowers and two, sadly only two, matched bystanders who had witnessed the same sequence of events. Um, so what I used was grounded theory, um, which essentially involved um, fracturing the narratives, coding chunks of the narrative into increasingly abstract categories, out of which um, here's an example of, um, of, of the mapping of one single individual's account. And what I'm trying to do here is draw out some of the important concepts for him and looking at the links between the things that were important to him and um, the, 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 the circles in blue are essentially, outside of the green circle are essentially events and stages in his process towards uh, whistleblowing. He was, did I say, he was an executive in the oil industry. The next stage, um, I, I know you'll get the overhead, so if you want to look at that in detail later, you can. Um, that is not going to show up. Hmm. That's annoying. Um, this was a messy map, which actually is supposed to have a lot of arrows loosely connecting. These are all the kind of abstracted concepts that I came up with. And what I discovered by the time I'd mapped them in this messy, thought-provoking way was that um, there, there were multiple pathways and then the journey was very much not a linear journey. Eventually, this is what I arrived at. Yes, that does just about show. Um, so this is a representation of the recursive whistleblowing journey, which was an abstraction from all of my informants, uh, my whistleblowing informants. And it's composed of stages, which you can see at the bottom, which was quasi-linear, but it was still recursive. That's to say that at each stage, um, my informant would talk about, for instance, accumulating facts and evidence, and maybe get them to a tipping point. But having got to a tipping point, they moved back into something that was remarkably common, a period of liminal space, where a kind of period of, of reflection, of removing themselves from, from a kind of active context. Um, and that, that came up in almost everybody's narrative, and then eventually moving on to find the voice. But the other part of it were the processes. Um, and the top one you can't see because, um, yeah, it's hidden. It's, it's supposed to say passionate attachment to the discursive idea of the organisation. And then policing of disciplinary discourse is really the response to the organization. And then um, what, what the whistleblower then begins to do is construct an act itself. And there's a kind of constant moving around these, these circles, these processes that it's, I, I think, um, some of the people that spoke this morning have already talked about what an endless process it is. And I think that's one of the things I'm trying to capture here. Something I wanted to just flag up, um, we haven't mentioned, is that people bring to these experiences templates from their early experiences that will necessarily shape them in some way, either towards or away from blowing whistle and making a difference to how they approach that. How, how they set about that pr process. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this. This was another sensitizing construct. What I did then was go back and reanalyze the data using Susan Long's um, transforming experience framework to explore um, this question. Why these experiences in this setting here and now? So I felt that I'd somehow lost the richness of my individual participants' informant stories. And I wanted to look again at how for each person, the system and the individual and the cultural stuff interacted. And so what I was attempting to do was answer that question. In terms of looking at context, I wanted to think about the wider context because um, I felt that that always essentially uh, 
or was it already impinges on an individual, whatever they're up to? Um, there are some very interesting studies on how journalism has, has mediated um, the idea of a whistleblower. But I, this time I wanted to look at films and uh, whistleblowing has been a, a favourite subject for films since the middle of last century. And actually, it, for a while, it seemed to be getting even more popular. And I think Wittgenstein helpfully said, as long as it's not frightfully bad, a film always provides me with food for thought and feelings. And I think that that very much was uh, what happens in, here's a list of um, not all the whistleblowing films through decades. I compiled list after list after list. There are about 50 from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which was launched in 1939. And the most recent one that I've come across, but other people might be able to correct me, is Official Secrets, is 2019. As I say, there are about 50 of them. But I picked out these as, as the kind of key things. And the message from these films is that whistleblowers may be a hero for our times, but the covert or implicit message in each of them, and especially for women, was that social and physical, social and or physical annihilation is likely to be the consequence of speaking out. And if you've seen so and official secrets, if you track that through that, those films, I think that that's what you, you find yourself noticing. Um, so what did I find for my studies? Um, so, in terms of systemic factors, um, organisations' enactments, what the organisation did to the individual, created whistleblowers as excluded and, in Judith Butler's terms, unrecognisable subjects in the interests of the organisation preserving its perverse or corrupt functioning, and perhaps also because the whistleblowers contain the organisation's lost goods, loss and hated good, good self. Whistleblowers um, experiencing Alfred's choices choice took up a new parisistic identity and then moving on to individual factors. So uh, what I was looking at here was as much how what people brought to the table um, to the table of the uh, the wrongdoing that they were faced with. One of the things I found that they had a lack of valency for the prevailing assumptions that were present in the organisation and that that might well have been um, early attachment history, for instance, primed people to be able to stand outside those sorts of influences. As they moved through this very recursive story, they were no longer able or willing to nuance conflicting ideas about the tasks at hand or the ethics. And the experience of being let down and experiencing a loss of trust and the experience of moral injury in the form of institutional betrayal was something that was very uh, formative. They moved on to construct a new identity or ethical self to rescue themselves from non-subjecthood, from the exclusion and, and the depersonalizing that, had, that they had been subject to. Um, I, I found looking at the material that they were drawn to enact as rescuers, first of all, to try and rescue their organisation, rescue the system, rescue their professional um, credibility, not their personal credibility, but the credibility of their profession. And then they uh, moved to become both rescuer and victim. This is in the idea of the drama triangle, which some of you may be familiar with. And something that I saw again and again was that um, people paraded their vulnerability as an ultimate weapon of nonviolent resistance. And Pussy Riot and Navalny come to mind as pertinent, um, uh, all too painfully recent examples. So Judith Butler, reflecting on, on this process, says, we're continuing to exist within the vexations of social relationships is the ultimate defeat of violent power. Bystanders, on the other hand, um, are largely acquiescent, were accommodating to the contested tasks. They still saw that the task was con contested and in some cases corrupted, but they felt themselves as powerless. My two, two very different bystander informants both remarked that they felt they were too low down the food chain to make any difference. They 
slotted into a kind of work group mentality and allegiance to task and to their professional skills and didn't get caught up in feeling that they could or should rescue the organisation. It was a kind of getting their heads down and getting on with it. Yet, I would argue that bystanders are the key to change again and again in, um, in corrupted systems. So cultural norms, these are the sorts of um, features that I picked up from um, looking at each of the cases that, that I, I heard from, that I worked with, and looking at the film study. So um, it, it provided evidence of features of the market civilization, refusing dependency in, uh, uh, across the board, approving of isolated or uh, autonomous individuals, that individuals get constructed as, as, as autonomous, separate, isolated. Monitoring and micromanagement replace requisite structures which would contain and channel um, appropriate behaviour. And supported by a post-truth era, there's a denial of the difference between image and reality. So any any old idea will do the most um, in, uh, because we don't believe any of them. So film, films, uh, my film studies warned that social and physical annihilation are the consequences of rebellion. And I think that's a very powerful message to be being pumped out across, across our cinemas. Um, and a very... Um, um, uninspiring message, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so just to remind you of what I thought the nature of whistleblowing was, and on the whole, I can find what I, what I started out thinking, and that's so often um, the course of research, I guess, that people became whistleblowers only because the system that they were working in required their silence. So, moving on to the impact of whistleblowing, and I wanted to speak about both moral injury and retaliation. And I wanted to touch on the two traumatizing consequences of experiencing and, uh, and uh, exposing wrongdoing, trying briefly to put some numbers on each, but noting that actually these two phenomena are linked in a vicious circle. And I just want to remind you of Alfred's broken lives. This is a composite. Um, uh, a person, but what we heard this morning, um, I, I think he's he's just got this as 2001 he produced this, but he's still captured in this um, composite vignette so many different and very painful things. Um, so I want to talk about moral injury briefly, which you could call a, a, a rupture of moral identity. Um, it was defined by Jonathan Shea in a series of, of, of books and articles, initially looking at the experience of military veterans um, in, in the Vietnam War. He came up with some characteristics of events that evoke moral injury, but bearing in mind that this was he formed his ideas in the context of the military, where there may well be one-off events, whereas with organisational uh, wrongdoing, actually it's a repetition of events. But it's a violation or betrayal of moral values by well, you as perpetrator, another person or the system in a high-stakes environment. And what he means by that is you can't say no, really. And... Um, it has some overlap with PTSD. Um, I think more with complex PTSD in that the assaults within organisational context anyway are ongoing and, are, and take place within treasured or entrapping relationships. And actually moral injury commonly lacks other features of PTSD. That's not to say, as we heard very powerfully this morning, that um, many whistleblowers do experience full-blown PTSD. But the quintessential feature of moral evaluation um, is um, moral injury, and that's absent from PTSD. And um, it, a, the case has been made that it's very important that we don't medicalise moral injury, that we don't scoop it up with PTSD and say, this has got to be treated with antidepressants or even psychotherapy, much as I might um, endorse that. That's about working with people with PTSD, with moral injury. It's something much, much more social and much more political. 
and for organizations, um, what we see is um, they're morally injurious by in institutional betrayal, by escalating commitment, doubling down, throwing the dead cat over the wall, attempts to turn a blind eye to their own ethical failings, and then scapegoating, which can express the hatred of the organization's own lost good self. <laughs> Whistleblowers, moral injury can enter their journey at various stages, being let down by a revered system or revered boss, being propelled towards the experience of choiceless choice in an effort to avoid or refuse the experience of living with moral injury, an effort to reincorporate the lost or alienated good self that their experiences of working within the organization has, has triggered in them, and a dread of living with the self that they despise. So a construction of whistleblowers as exceptional and as lone tragic heroes also can operate as a social defence against recognising the need and responsibility to achieve change at a social level. And something I've been very struck by that's referred to in the literature occasionally is the um, zombification, which is the dissociation feature of PTSD, a very routine uh, feature of PTSD, which people trapped in, these, in, in, in a situation of moral injury can experience as the only option of dealing with living in the living within the lie and having to treat it as truth. Um, so I also wanted to make the point that the phenomenon can be played out at a wider cultural and political level too. Um, just give you a moment to So the consequences of moral injury and retaliation, which kind of work together. Uh, career damage, which can be formal or informal. Um, how am I doing for time? Two minutes. Okay, I'm going to absolutely whiz through this. Financial, the time pressures, social and family relationships, much of this we've heard about. Mental health and neurological changes. And I put some links to useful blogs and websites about um, mental health and neurological changes. And in fact, Helen told us that some of the data from the Dutch study about mental health um, that I think is very helpful. Let's just very briefly touch on recovery strategies then. If I look at individual processes, one of the things that really emerges is how important it is to construct a fresh narrative incorporating but not masking the changes in identity and worldview that moral injury and this whole process of living um, and, and moving towards whistleblowing or bystanding has, has evoked. And together with that, social, political and legal level developments to recognise and protect the essential role of whistleblowers. And Kate Kenny makes a very powerful argument for whistleblowing being treated as a, as a job and a very important job that society commissions whistleblowers to do and that they should be adequately not only protected but compensated. So if we look at um, collective and social level, Mannion, who reviewed a whole distressingly long series of um, investigations, inquiries about um, malpractice in the NHS remarked, if you have to call someone a whistleblower, then it's already gone wrong. You've already sort of lost the battle. And so what emerges from this, from my, to my mind, from my study and from surveys like Mannion's, that you need to engage the whole system, particularly the bystanders and the leaders, to combat wrongdoing and achieve change. And that the duty of candour and good Samaritan laws are effective and have unintended consequences. But the lawyers amongst you maybe will address that in better detail than I possibly could. That there are various defences against change, calling out bad apples to deny it's a systemic problem, um, saying that we'll enact culture change, which happens at the end of 
every NHS inquiry. And that's a defence against taking action. And then treating the problem as a set of simple facts with simple solutions. Um, it's a defence against recognising that these are wicked problems which are more about values and that they're always going to be difficult and uncertain. So the important thing is to build collective narratives which are shared through the whole relevant group. And I, I wanted to draw on um, no, ex um, strategies that aren't necessarily uh, come up in uh, uh, whistleblowing thinking. One is Schwartz rounds. Um, those of you who work in the NHS might have put, <laughs> um, participated in those. And essentially, a whole extended multidisciplinary team gets together to construct a narrative out of the testimonies of people who are affected by particular um, distressing circumstances. Another strategy is um, narrative emotional therapy, which um, is, is used commonly with um, people with very specific trauma, but it has been delivered to whole communities traumatized by civil war. And a whole community gets together again to construct this narrative. Um, and uh, restorative justice has already been mentioned. I want to make a shout out for humour by using rhetoric. Um, the rhetoric in humour legitimates truth telling, is essentially relational and shared. So, uh, a joke isn't a joke until somebody's heard it and laughed at it. And to and and it's the the, the comedian is <laughs> able to enact ambivalence and uncertainty to embrace the difficulty of the kind of problems that, um, that, that we're hearing about and that whistleblowers are reporting about. And I'd um, point those, if you haven't seen it already, look at John Oliver's interview with Snowden, which he made in 2015. Um, not only is it incredibly funny, but it's also really, really powerful. And I've given you a link to that on my last slide. And actually, there's um, the final episode of Seinfeld questioned very powerfully the value of Good Samaritan laws. Both of those are really worth a look. Finally, <laughs> teaching uh, different kinds of <laughs> very quickly. Usually, there's didactic teaching about universal a priori um, ethical principles or utilitarian principles. They don't apparently do the job that um, in medical ethics, there's no sign that there's any long-term change. Instead, come full circle to parisiastic behaviour um, and want to make a strong argument for teaching virtue ethics, which is using Foucault's ideas about the discourse of care for the self, teaching whole systems to construct and support a parisiastic identity, which is systemic, not individual. Well, thank you, especially from Arhesia for mentioning exactly what we're on about. <laughs> and um, my great hero, Foucault, who, who, if you haven't gone and read him, go and read his six lectures for Stanford University in the late 90s, which explains fearless speech brilliantly. Bridget, thank you very much indeed. I think we've got time for one or two questions very briefly. So, um, Nicholas. Really interesting in your narrative and recovery. Uh, those of us who've been involved in whistleblowing situations and also experienced a counter culture to that where the state for instance can't cope with the truth mm -hmm. so it creates its own narrative that it's happier to live with denying the reality mm -hmm. of what's being exposed and that's quite hard for the whistleblower because you've revealed the truth and the discomfort of it and people don't want to face it and society creates its own counter narrative. <clears throat> Lots of lawyers in this room, activist lawyers, left wing lawyers, activist judges, you name it. So as soon as they bump into reality in the courtroom, the state then flips it back at them and creates a, a culture that it's more comfortable with. And I wonder, <laughs> how, how do we counter that? Because it adds to the woe of the whistleblower because you've revealed an uncomfortable truth. And then that the state decides to create its own truth on top of that with all the organs of the state to go with it. Well, I guess my favourite solution might be humour. 
Um, I think one only has to listen to the news quiz to realise the subversive power. But the point is about humour that it has a way of rhetorically reaching out to a much wider public to, uh, to, to achieve that kind of culture change so that it's the, the, the deadening of moral responsibility that can enable a politician to suggest that homelessness is a lifestyle choice becomes... How can, how can people say that? I mean, half the population thought that, but the point is to get everybody saying it and then also moving slowly along the process towards action rather than leaving it to these lone, isolated, autonomous heroes, you know, the whistleblowers. That's just, that's never going to be good enough. Hi, so I was interested in your um, explanation of moral injury compared to PTSD. If, if somebody wanted to refer to that as sort of a specific condition, for example, in an employment tribunal for an injury to feelings award or something like that, is that accepted as a, as a medical um, definition? You can't get any experts on it or, you know? No. Um, <laughs> I, very recently, I, the ICD-10... Um, um, actually, it is um, a diagnostic kind of catalogue has come around to complex PTSD. And complex PTSD has many features in common. It's not the same. As I said, it doesn't have that moral bit. But that gives a sort of platform for making that argument that no, it's not in any diagnostic manual. Yeah, okay. Because I, I think it's a really good point. And I think that's sort of reflective of a lot of people's experience, but it feels. Yes. Yeah, how, how would you get that in front of, you know, um, you know <coughs> judge, really? Yeah, thank you. I think we're going to cut it there. Bridget, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.